I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. Today we're going to look at a few of the most dramatic restorations. This is some of the most rewarding work I've ever done, and I hope you enjoy it. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorm, Maine. This is a nice chest of drawers. Stylistically, it's from the early 1800s, like Louis XVI uh, into the Directoire period, or maybe uh, Regency. But I don't think this piece of furniture is that old. I think it's, a, a, it's an old piece of furniture. It's a reproduction now. But it is handmade, solid wood, mortise and tenon joints. It's a very nice piece of furniture. It needs a lot of work. It has a lot of inlay repairs, veneer repairs. The finish is in really bad shape. It's going to need to be refinished. However, this video is just going to be on focus on one aspect of the restoration, and that's the repair of these side panels. These are all veneered, and the veneer is coming off. But in order to clamp this down, I'm going to have to disassemble this chest of drawers so that I can have flat panels to clamp. The first step is going to be to uh, see if I can remove the top. I had seen, looking from underneath, these holes all neatly arranged all the way around. I thought this top was uh, probably screwed onto here. But as I look down these holes with a little uh, flashlight, all I see is glue down in there. So I'm probing around this piece of wood here. It seems it seems pretty tight. I'm assuming that this whole top frame is glued to the subframe here. I think I'm going to uh, hit this a little bit with a mallet, but then I may just have to start uh, getting the heat gun and going around the perimeter of this thing, see if I can loosen it up. Well, luckily this knife blade seems to, to be going under there, possibly breaking uh, any bond that's there. In fact, I think I... It's opening up, so I think I'm just going to keep going around like this, see what I get. I think I'll go along and loosen this up, and then start putting some wedges in there, loosen up along the front. Well, this seems to be working. I mean, it's loosening up. There, I think this is glued down. There's not a lot of glue. It's just letting loose as I go along. So I'm just going to go around the whole perimeter of this until this top comes off. See, the core of this top section is plywood, and um, I'm trying to keep that top layer of plywood from splitting away. So you can see here where the plywood's hanging on, things about ready to lift off. I think it's loose. All right, excellent. Now there's pieces of wood from the top stuck to this, and I just may uh, leave them right where they are when we, when, when we reattach that top. These pieces of veneer that split away from that will go back right where they belong. You know, I've decided after removing the top, and I'm not sure if this case is really going to come apart. I don't want to cause uh, any damage, so I think I'm not going to take the case apart after all. I still will remove these drawer guides, I need to have the back of this clear to facilitate you know, being able to glue down the veneer on these sides. So I'm going to go ahead and remove these drawer runners. What I'm discovering is that there's a, there's a nail in here, but I might be able to pry this up. Okay, I've got all the drawer runners out. Now the next step is to see if I can get this veneer panel off of here. I'm going to start with the heat gun and some knives and see if I can start working it up. You can see that this first part is very loose. I don't even really need heat, but I'm going to keep applying heat because it's, it's down in this area. So I need to keep working my heat up in there as best I can and, and see if this glue will loosen up. Here on the edge, the inlay is kind of splitting. 
I'm going to have to cut that inlay loose with a razor blade to make sure it can come up with the minimum amount of damage. Okay, that's off of there. Let's talk about how I'm going to glue this up. Here you see a cross section of a piece of veneered wood. Take a clamp and apply some pressure directly to the piece. The pressure radiates out from the clamps at 45 degree angles. Put on another clamp, same thing. The problem here is that if you don't put the clamps close enough together, you can get spots where there isn't any pressure or not enough pressure to do the job. And with a clamping job like this one, there's only enough room for a couple of clamps. So here's what you do. Take your piece of wood, put another piece of wood up against it. This is called a platen. And behind your platen, a bracing piece of wood called the call. That way, when you put on the clamp, and apply the pressure, it radiates out over a much larger area. Now you can put on a second clamp and know that you're getting pressure over the whole surface of the wood. So when the glue dries and you take off the calls, the platens, and the clamps, your piece of veneered wood is nice and flat. So now I'm going to cut some MDF, which is medium density fiberboard. I'm going to cut sheets of MDF to go on either side of this panel for the platens. First I'm going to install my uh, platens on the inside. Now I'll hold these in place with a stick. I'm using a lot of glue on this surface and I, I know that this glue cannot fill gaps or <laughs> correct the unevenness of the surface, but I just feel like I want to put down a lot of glue and hope for the best. Now this platen is covered with plastic. These calls have a camera to them, like this, which will give us really even pressure. find out tomorrow. Okay, let's uh, let's see what we got. Oh, it looks really good. It seems nice and flat. Okay, this is the other side of the cabinet that we glued up uh, exactly the same way as the other side. Let's see what it looks like. Alright, this came out well, it's, it's, it's down, it's, uh, it's nice and flat. Okay, so now I'm going to remove the tape, I'm going to uh, wash off this excess glue with some water, 
I'm going to patch any spaces where I can, uh, where the inlay is missing. I'm going to fill in the other cracks and spaces with wood putty so that when I strip it, the stripper won't attack my glue through these cracks. I'm just giving the putty a quick sand, smooth it out a little bit before I strip this. I didn't appreciate how beautiful the veneer was. Now I will apply the first of three coats of shellac. All right, here we have this uh, very nice little Louis XV style reproduction chest of drawers, probably built in the uh, early 20th century. Uh, we did a lot of veneer repairs to this with the inlay and even on the top, but of course this video just concerned itself with the sides. And those we took off, re-glued, and then we had to sand them down, so we just refinished the entire piece. But uh, I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson Antique Furniture Restoration in Gorham, Maine. This is a nice late Victorian table. I say late Victorian, I mean like 1890s. I've seen a lot of furniture from that period that's made out of cherry or birch, uh, stained dark. Now, this kind of sunburst pattern is very common to that era. I call this table a campaign table because it has an interesting feature in that it comes apart. Ready to travel. I'm hoping that I can clean the base and restore that finish. The top has completely come apart at every joint. I need to remove that, re-glue it, and refinish it. You know, because there's so much uh, blackness on these joints, and it, I don't know if it's mold, but it kind of looks like mold or could be mold, so I'm going to wash these with a bleach solution. Now, I'm going to use regular glue for this glue up, although I like to use hide glue for antiques. I need a much longer working time that I can get with this uh, yellow glue. You can see, I wasn't, uh, I, obviously these are lousy joints. I couldn't run them through the joint or I'd lose too much wood, there were so many. <clears throat> but I wasn't really prepared for how hard it would be to get them to come together on the ends. Um, but I think it's going to be all right. This, uh, this came out really well, especially considering the uh, 
kind of frantic blew up yesterday. So, uh, why am I scraping this top and not sanding it? You know, I have uh, belt sanders, I have tons of pneumatic sanders, but what I'm hoping for is to, just to scrape this top. I'll lightly sand it when I'm done with some 220. Uh, but I don't want this tabletop to necessarily be perfectly flat. Uh, I'm not going to put texture in on purpose, but I'm just using a scraper. If there's a little bit of texture or a little bit of unflatness, that's fine. So I was going after uh, specific spots with the card scraper, but now it's sort of I want to go over the whole top and even it out, and so I'll use the uh, Stanley number 80. This uh, end grain is going to be the toughest part to sand. scrape the top. There's some dark uh, dark stains here and so I'm going to treat this with oxalic acid. I haven't really uh, measured out too carefully. I'm going to give a, a, a few good scoops to maybe a quart of water, hot water. So while this dries, I'm going to clean the base. I want to get an idea of uh, what color we're going for here. Okay, it's dry now, and I'm going to uh, sand it with 220 by hand. Okay, I've sanded this whole top with 220, including the edges. So now I want to stain it. Even originally, these pieces were done with uh, uh, dye stain. Uh, that's why you can never really get the stain out, and I don't want to anyway. So I have a dye stain here. Uh, it's made to spray. It's walnut dye stain, probably uh, acetone or something like that. I'm going to thin it out with some a lot of uh, lacquer retarder to see if I can slow it down enough so that I can pat it. I need to add uh, more stain. Okay, the stain is dried now, so uh, it looks a lot lighter than it did when I stained it, but uh, I'm just going to go with it. I'm going to give it a coat of this tongue oil varnish. I don't think you could see it, but they, when I was putting on the coat, there were areas that it seemed like it wanted to fish eye. In other words, it seemed like there were areas that were resisting the finish and it was kind of 
making craters. But as I kept tipping this off, it stays wet for a long time, I kept tipping it off and uh, those areas seem to have disappeared. So I hope it dries just like this. We'll find out tomorrow. So this top, uh, this top looks good. Uh, the color is, it, it is great, but it's a little light, which is good. Uh, the next thing, what I need to do to figure out my color on this top is get a coat of the uh, tongue oil varnish uh, on the base here. So when I cleaned this, I scrubbed it really well with a uh, Scotch-Brite pad, and I don't think I need to do anything to it now. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll go over to the shiny areas here. Maybe I'll go over this a little bit more with the Scotch-Brite pad, and then I'll just brush on a coat. So even though when I was washing this, I was finding paint spots and they were coming off, I still find everywhere stupid paint. So what I'm going to do here is I put a little bit of this uh, Goof Off product in a container and then with a 3M pad that seems to take the paint right off. You know, the, uh, the legs are really dark, but uh, um, this color I'm seeing on the apron here, which is very similar to the color on the top that I have now, uh, I think that's, I think that's going to be the color I'm going to go for right there. Okay, so it's obvious the top is a little light. That's going to be fine. I'm going to uh, sand this top and go over it with a Scotch-Brite pad, and then I'm going to glaze it with some asphaltum glaze. All right, uh, glazing with asphaltum is just like glazing with anything else. Uh, you got your glaze, and you uh, want to have a rag handy, and two brushes, one to apply and one which I will call a dry brush to sort of even it out if you need to. You can see that I'm not trying to wipe it all off. In fact, I'm making a pad trying to leave a little on here. I want that color. And now I'll take my dry brush and I, I want to leave a little more on the edges and I want to leave a little more on the edge molding. Alright, let this dry overnight. Okay, the asphaltum glaze has uh, dried overnight. This looks good, it's really hard to tell and when it's when it's flashed off like this. But here's the base and I want to put this top on the base very gingerly because this is just sitting there. I took the hardware off so it's not attached. So this looks good at least at first glance. We'll know for sure until I put the next coat on this. It appears that the edge blends in with the apron really really well. And if the top's a little bit lighter that's what I want. Uh, I've noticed that almost all antiques they're darker at the bottom and they get lighter as they come up and the top is usually the lightest part of all. Alright, I'm going to put a coat of gloss on the top. You know, going into this I thought for sure I was going to have to add color to the finish. Uh, you know, put some stain in the top coats, but right now it doesn't look like I need to. So I'm going to give this a coat of the gloss finish and the apron another coat. No, I'm really, uh, I'm really liking this color a lot. I think this will be good. Uh, hopefully, I'll just need one more coat. It's always good at some point during the process to flip these things over and just give a quick coat to the underside and uh, like this apron. Uh, I'm not going to coat 
these boards, I'm not going to coat the board where the stencil is, but I just want to make this a little bit neater. Okay, everything's uh, looking good here. The tabletop dried fine. I think it uh, just needs one more coat. Everything just needs one more coat. But before I do that final coat, I want to do some assembly work. I want to assemble the top uh, onto the apron, which of course means I got to uh, address this hardware, I got to clean this hardware up. There are also casters on this table. I don't I may not have mentioned that in the introduction because they weren't on the table, but I have these casters. So I'm going to clean these up, uh, especially these, and get them uh, installed on this uh, apron frame. You know, I thought that these brackets were just iron, and I was going to clean them off on the lathe with a wire wheel. And then I noticed this little glint. I think these uh, maybe were bronze plated or something. So I'm just going to clean them off with uh, this uh, metal cleaner. I tried it a little bit and it seems to bring it back somewhat. Uh, these are stamped with a patent also and it does say 1887 same as the table itself. Now I want to uh, screw this top, uh, screw this apron to the top, but you'll notice that the boards they use run perpendicular to the grain of the top, uh, not really allowing for a lot of wood movement. So I'm going to take a drill and ream these holes a little bit back and forth in the direction of the wood movement to allow the screws to move with the wood. So now you can see that the hole is elongated and the screw now can move back and forth hopefully enough to accommodate any wood movement. And, um, you know, I'm tightening the screws, you know, so that they're snug, but I'm not cranking them down and not making them too tight because I want them to be able to move if necessary. So I might as well uh, sand this apron before I flip it over and sand the top. I'm going to sand the flats a little bit with 320, but then go after it with a scotch Bright gray pad. Uh, same treatment on the top, but I'm going to sand with 500, and then the gray pad. Uh, you always want to sand with as fine as grit as will do the job. So with the 500, you know, obviously it's not uh, very coarse sandpaper, and so it's cutting back the finish a bit, uh, getting rid of all the nits, and uh, any other things, but I'm not trying to make this perfect by any means. Uh, this feels great, nice and smooth. Now I'll go over the edges with the gray pad, and then I'll go over the top with the gray pad too. And then I'll have a good idea of, of uh, what it's going to be like when I put the final coat on. See, I'm going after these shiny areas. I'm not trying to make them go away entirely, but I'm definitely cutting them back a bit. Now I'm going to uh, just wipe this down with this uh, product, it's called a wax wash remover. It's, uh, it's paint thinner, it must have other stuff in it too that's designed to remove contaminants from the wood. And I don't suspect I have any particular contaminants here, but I've gotten a habit of uh, wiping down with this anyway. Uh, I think it really helps to get a really good final coat. Now while that's drying, I'll go over the base uh, just with a, a gray pad. Now for the final coat, I'll use uh, satin. So uh, 
everything's looking really good here. So it has uh, like, like little nits in the top. And then other than that, I think I just need to uh, steel wool it with some polish. But before I do anything and reassemble this, uh, I didn't yet uh, uh, do the wheels. And they appear just to be, you know, iron wheels or steel wheels, and I will clean them off uh, with a wire wheel on the lathe. So this is such a slow drying finish that you're bound to get little nits in it. As I feel across here, I can just feel an even distribution of little nits. So I've got a piece of craft paper here, you know, like think of a, a brown paper bag. And I'll just take this paper and go over the top. Yeah, that's taking care of those nits. And it doesn't change the sheen. These legs feel fine. But I'll just go over them quickly with the paper anyway. It gives them that really smooth feel. So now I'm just going to go over this top uh, kind of lightly with some 4 aught steel wool and the uh, orange oil beeswax polish here. Now I'm not applying uh, a lot of pressure or anything. I'm just really going over very lightly. Uh, the top was already smooth and uh, this is just sort of giving it that little extra. There we go. Nice little uh, late Victorian campaign table, uh, 1890s, in fact the patent date of 1887 on this table. It's a campaign table because the legs are easily removable uh, with no tools, yet it's remarkably sturdy. It's completely sturdy. It's a good, uh, good design. And of course this tabletop desperately needed to be refinished, but I scraped it by hand. Uh, brushed on the finish. I think it looks pretty good. I'm Tom Johnson, Thomas Johnson, Antique Furniture Restoration, in Gorm, Maine. This is a very nice antique federal card table. That means 1790 to 1820. It's a card table because it has a fly leg, swings out, and supports the top. In my book on card tables, uh, one of the characteristics of this table, namely this very nice turned leg, uh, seemed to indicate that it's from the north shore of Massachusetts, uh, possibly the Salem area. And so what ha what's happened is, in an accident, this table got pushed forward, fell down, and it broke the whole front part of this apron. You can see there's parts loose here and a, a big crack all along here. And that's what needs to be repaired. I want to see if I can take this top off of here. It's held on by about five screws. And you can see how the apron is made up. There's a couple of big boards that were glued together. Then it was sawed out. There's a lot of short grain here. Over here where the molding is missing, you can see that it, the entire apron is short grain. And sure enough, that's where it's breaking. And you can see that this outside layer of veneer basically helps hold the whole thing together. Uh, 
two screws in the back are uh, just missing altogether. Oh well, we'll fix that later. Well, this is uh, quite a mess here. I'm not sure exactly how to proceed here. I think I think I've got to glue this section up first and then maybe do this afterwards but I'm a little unsure. I think I'll start clamping this up dry without glue. And we have quite a few of the missing pieces. I don't think we have them all but there's a few. And those screws that were missing from the back they were in the envelope with the pieces. So I've been fooling around with a few different ways to clamp this. And I've got a few issues here. I've got to bring this part together this way to where it's supposed to be. And I've got to clamp downwards or this way to bring them together. But I've also got to clamp the front of this to make sure that all this, the whole front surface is all lined up exactly where it's supposed to be. And I've also realized while I was working here that the table just can't stand here uh, with clamps all over the front of it. I gotta move it back to my bench. Okay, off camera, I clamped this all up dry without glue. And I can never uh, understate the importance of gluing something up dry first so you know what you're gonna do. And uh, so I'm ready to go. And I've heated up some uh, hide glue. This is a piece of uh, regular quarter-inch ply, covered in plastic. Let that dry overnight. Yeah, nice and nice and flat. Boy, this came out great. Nice and level, it's all together. Uh, now let's see if I can get this next piece in here successfully. There's a lot of glue on here. That went down great, especially those two pieces I had to get in there. They're fine. Now I've got two more pieces uh, that I can glue in here. So that's next. I wish I had glued this piece in when I did this whole first glue up. I didn't realize it at the time. 
but it just means I need to undercut the back of it a little bit so I can fit it in there. Now, before I do this next glue up, take a look at this inlay right here. And I'm missing about an inch and a half of it. That went down really well. Okay, so now I've got two missing pieces here, a large piece missing, and some inlay missing here. First step is wash all this uh, glue off. It just takes water. These side panels uh, is a flame figure. Uh, I'm gonna, I gotta assume it's mahogany. This center field looks more like birch to me. Wood identification is always difficult, especially when it's figured wood like that. I brought down all my sleeves that had any kind of figure in them to see what I can find. It's got some nice figure to it. It's got bird's eye too, but maybe I can work around that. Here's some good stuff. I wouldn't think to find any in the walnut. Hmm. Hmm. This is nice and light. Look at this area here. Crotch walnut. This is good stuff and I like that color and the figure. These are scraps from uh, Joe Van Benton, furniture maker in Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. Here's some maple though. Look at that. That could be good. This stuff too, especially where you have these mineral spots in it. Now I don't expect to find that inlay, but at least I'll look. Maybe I have some possibilities. Uh, this is my box of inlay, which is uh, just a cardboard box I've been meaning to build a better one for years. But I also have this box of inlay, which I recently inherited from my dad's shop. My oldest brother ran my dad's shop for like 45 years, and um, uh, he passed away two years ago, and so I inherited this ancient box of inlay from my dad's shop. Wow, going through all this inlay is neat. I'm uh, putting it all together by types, and I finally found a use for all these uh, wire ties I've been hanging on to. So it's nice to get these organized. I did actually find some pieces that uh, might work for the table. Most of the new inlay is just not that good for restoration. It's very rare to find anything that matches. Uh, but you can piece together stuff. You can make your own inlay. These are lots of examples here of inlay in process that was used. And you can also have uh, inlay made by Matt Virginac or inlaybanding.com. This is inlay that I had Matt make. I know that after I patch this, I'm going to have to sand it. Uh, so I'm going to sand it a little bit now so I can get a better look at what kind of wood this is. I think we can make this work. And I found a piece of veneer here that I'm uh, liking even better.
I'm liking this area right right in here. I think if that part of the patch is right in here, that should work out fine. Well, for all that uh, careful cutting, I still have a few gaps here and there, but that's what they make putty for. Not bad. All right, now I have to address the issue of the missing inlay. And I did find something similar that I could cut up and use, but it's not exactly right. I may see if it's uh, feasible to piece something together. So I'm going to try to uh, make some of that inlay. I've got a piece of uh, ebony veneer, and I have lots of strips of holly and ebony. Let's just see if I can piece them together.
Okay, I've got all my parts cut. I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm using hot hide glue, so I got a heater here, a little radiator, heating this up. I need a lot of working time. That's why I had to take off my sweatshirt. First thing I'm going to do is uh, take the bottom piece and double stick tape it down to the board here. I'm off here, and I think it's because these strips maybe are slightly different widths, and I don't know if I can get it going again or not. I'm going to have to double up so I get back on track here. Alright, this is one of those days where you uh, wake up and can't wait to get in the shop and see how this glue up went. I think that'll work. So the next step is I want to clean out this uh, groove where the inlay goes. Uh, I want to do that first before I slice it because I think that my inlay is a little bit too fat, maybe by a 30 second. I got to reduce that thickness here. I got my piece of inlay. Now I have a little piece of the original inlay that I took out of that groove over there and I'm going to glue that in right here. All right, the glue, glue is dried. Uh, I'm going to trim this inlay down and then sand. So I've done these two little patches off camera. They were much the same as the big patch. And I'm got, I've got lots of little places here uh, to use wood putty on. And then I'm going to sand this entire front apron from leg to leg. Now I'm sanding with 150. I just want to be as careful as possible. I don't want to sand any more than I need to. These pieces of tape have got to just be sanded off. I like the grain of the patch. 
and luckily it's a little browner. this uh, molding is loose. And the reason I say luckily is because I need to measure the thickness of it. I need to make a new molding for this spot over here. It looks like 930 seconds. I was going to remove this molding to uh, trace the curve, but I realized it's much longer uh, what I really need to know is the, you know, is the length of this. So I started poking around, and this molding on this side is loose. So I'll remove this side, and I can trace it out exactly. Yeah, this piece fits perfectly here, so this is a good template for my new piece. I'm just going to uh, sand the round over. Uh, I want to get some stain and finish on this uh, before I install it. I've got some uh, walnut dye stain here. These certainly appear to be the original nails. They've been making these nails for 200 years. That's a little bit late for this table. I was hoping it'd be the same company that made these nails. But these look more like, kind of like wrought nails, whereas these nails are cut nails. Well, the uh, stain is dried, so now I'll give it a coat of shellac. And I'm going to use garnet shellac. That's really a, a dark amber shellac. Uh, regular shellac is much lighter. I'll show you. This is regular shellac. Just what you'd expect. There's your garnet. And look at the color of the garnet next to the colors you see here. Okay, I can put this, uh, this molding back on now. This is dried enough so I can install it now. Uh, I'm going to uh, pre-drill some holes in this for the nails.
even though I've nailed this, I'm still going to clamp it. All right, I've sanded this whole front apron uh, really well with 220, uh, up to 220. I sanded with 150 and 220. And now uh, a coat of Garnet Schlack. This is dried for four or five hours, so uh, I'm going to give it another coat. Uh, first, I'm going to put some stain on this molding here. I'll smooth it a little with a gray pad. This is a thinned out, perfect brown dye stain. I've let this dry overnight. Uh, so now I'm going to sand this with 320. I'm going to go uh, over my touch-ups again and then uh, I'm going to adjust the color a little bit. This is a small brush tip marker. Even though I did these yesterday with a dye stain, uh, I think I brushed on the shellac too soon and took some of the stain off. Now back to what I said about adjusting the color. This front panel looks great, but if you look at the other panels, uh, they're different. Uh, the, this panel is a little uh, brighter, a little orangier. I think what I need to do is go over it with some uh, raw umber aerosol toner. Well, that looks good so far. At least I haven't screwed it up yet. The uh, maple looks perfect. The maple field. I'm going to take. I'm going to let this dry. Take this off, and then I need to spray the mahogany part again. So uh, off camera, I sprayed it one more time with the raw umber, and uh, I think it looks it looks really good now. And so now I'm going to spray the whole repair area. I'll remove this tape uh, with the aerosol shellac. Now I'm using the aerosol because I just don't want to disturb all the color work I've got here. I've let this dry overnight and now I'm going to sand with uh, 800. All right, I'm going to wipe it off with a, a little bit of a solvent here, paint dinner type stuff. And then I'm going to pat it with this uh, Lubricite padding lacquer. Alright, I'm going to let this uh, first coat dry uh, and I'll, I've got work to do on the rest of the table. Okay, here's the top. 
The top looks great. Uh, looks like birch to me, which I guess goes along with this being a New England piece. Uh, it's got a nice old kind of brushed on finish. Uh, I guess that means it's probably varnish. It's been damaged some, I suppose, maybe when the, in the accident it's got some uh, gouges and scratches here. Uh, but I'm not going to refinish this top. I think it looks great. The edge is uh, banded with cross grain banding vertically and then uh, more inlay. And it's got the usual kind of uh, cracks and stuff that you would expect, that kind of construction. If I find anything that's loose, I'll glue it down. Uh, and anything that's missing, I'll fill in with some wax, but I'm not going to mess with it too much. So the top has six or seven gouges like this. This is by far the worst one. And I'm going to fill those in with the uh, heated wax sticks. First step always is to clean it. I like using a commercial cleaner degreaser uh, like this one. Spray it on the rag and then use a padding motion. So as you're cleaning, and the rag keeps coming up cleaner and cleaner, uh, also the, the rag starts sliding very easily, and uh, you know that the surface is clean. And not only that, the top looks great. Uh, I think I'm only going to need to wax this after I do the repairs. Now I'll fill these defects. You know, usually I, after dripping the wax into the defect, I then take a larger uh, flat blade like this and smooth it out and then wipe away the excess with the rag. And uh, the thing I never liked about that was it kind of dishes out the wax a little bit. So this time, after dripping it in, I'm just trying to shave it off with a razor blade. It seems to be working well. Now, any light scratches or even in some of the places that were too shallow around my wax uh, fill-ins uh, hit with a little color. Oh, I can't forget this uh, loose bit on the edge. And there's a place for a wax <coughs> fill in too. All right, I'm ready to begin the uh, waxing. And I'm using uh, Brie Wax that's uh, tinted light brown. That'll help color in any scratches or minor defects, hopefully, kind of like scratch cover. Now before I wax the base, I'm going to go over the legs with the scratch cover. And that's like a polish with a little bit of stain in it. Uh, you know, I just want to get rid of all these marks, uh, mostly on the feet here and a couple of other places. Now I want to wipe off as much of that scratch cover as I can with a paper towel. And a paper towel seems to be the, the best for getting it all off. The legs and aprons look like they don't need anything else uh, after the scratch cover, but it'll dull after a little while, so uh, I'll wax them. It'll make it easier to wax, and that should keep the, the sheen. And I'll use a little steel wool to apply the wax to these side panels just to uh, help uh, smooth them out.
there you have it, a really nice uh, federal card table. Uh, in other words, it opens up. It has a beautiful birch top, which is unusual in my experience, but you know, further indication that it was made here in New England. But it also has special meaning to the owner of this table, as it once belonged to the novelist Kenneth Roberts. If you remember, this whole apron was broken. I glued it all back together to a small patch there. A new piece of inlay, I wish it matched better, but it's kind of neat. And uh, I think it looks pretty good. I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please subscribe and like, and be sure to hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified when I put out a new video.